Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Slam Fire Radio microcast. Um, tonight's episode is a listener request. We have invited on a very special guest to talk about Oak Island. So I would be remiss to not mention Nova Scotia because Nova Scotia or Oak Island is in Nova Scotia. Our guest is from Nova Scotia. So before we get started, um, we would just like to wish all of our friends and uh, listeners in Nova Scotia a heartfelt. We're thinking of you. Yeah. We really uh, are. Your community, your province yeah. has been devastated by it terrible tragedy it, it absolutely sucks there are no words um yeah, yeah if we're thinking of it if you need something reach out if you want to talk you know um it's just completely devastating um so with that uh jordan how are you doing man oh doing weird it's like 2020 is definitely the strangest and frightening year uh, i've lived through just just two days ago, I referred to 2020 as the uncle who molests you. That's I just I don't know how else to describe 2020. I mean, it's been oh man, like I was going through my personal 2020 hit list of work related problems, father dying, friends with cancer, friends losing their homes, uh, this COVID stuff. Now this this one of the worst mass shootings in Canadian history, if not the worst. It is the worst now. Yeah, it is. Hmm. Yeah. So, seems like every time you and I get together, Jordan, we're talking about mass shootings. Yeah, it seems that way. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of glad that tonight's topic is something a lot lighter. Like, I think I need the escape of Oak Island. Right. Me too. So, it's, it's like, yeah. So, uh, uh, welcome back, Jordan Bonaparte, host and creator of uh, Nighttime Podcast. It's good to have you back. How is the Nighttime Podcast, buddy? How's how are things going? Things are going good. It's uh. There's a lot of weird stuff to talk about, a lot of dark stuff. Uh, fortunately, um, my next couple episodes, I'm taking a break from the crime and dark stuff and looking at some UFOs that were filmed above Halifax uh, back in December. But things are going good. It's uh, There's always something interesting to talk about there, so I'm, I'm loving it. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's, um, I was thinking about you the other day. I was, coming, I was driving through Miramichi, and I drove uh, not far from the old arena, and there was a there's a story there I want to tell you about that you might want to look into sometime, but it's almost impossible. Like it's going to be, it's going to you're going to need to get Teth Tess from the uh, Staunching Legends podcast to be your lead researcher for this one. Yeah, um, a buddy walks out after a hockey game, never to be seen again. Ooh. Just went to the hockey game and uh, walked out of the hockey game, and no one's seen him since. Oh, well, for a lot mystery. of people, that'd be a good way to die, a good way to go. Good yeah. <laughs> Yeah. hours but um yeah. speaking of tests and astonishing legends they're on my next episode are you serious yeah that's so awesome oh man as is captain from true crime garage all right that's it you have in a ufo episode so it's like, it's pretty interesting it's hard to beat the captain yeah it is oh man that's all awesome. you're hanging out with all the big dogs yeah, well, you're somebody now, man. We're over here at Slam Fire Radio. No one knows who we are. You're <laughs> hanging out with the biggest names in true crime. That's awesome. Um, yeah. All right. So we're here to talk about a mystery, uh, something that is near and dear to both of our hearts, um, and actually how you and I got to know each other because uh, your show was introduced to me because you covered Oak Island and had mm -hmm. Dave Blankenship on. So your yeah. first episode that I listened to was an Oak Island episode. And then I started cool. sending you messages and then um, we were on each other's shows and I did some voice, uh, some voice work for one of your episodes. And, and you were my correspondent. I sent you to Victoria, BC that time. That's right. I did that too. Really? Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I didn't actually send him. He just happened to be Sounded anyway. better that way. Okay. Though. You should add it to your resume. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Both of us. Mm -hmm. Nighttime podcast correspondent. Yeah. 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 Just for a while there, every time Jordan did an episode, I had some kind of um, story to tell about it or a way I was connected to. He did the Belle Isle boom. I was like, I was just on Belle Island. What are the chances? <laughs> anyway. Um, so we're here to talk about Oak Island. Uh, Jordan, when did you first discover Oak Island and the mystery? You know, like it was since I was born, I, I knew about it really. My granddad, who 
played a big part in raising me. His, he, his childhood best friends kind of grew up on the island. Um, his, uh, my granddad's. You're a one-upper. That's what it is. You're a one-upper. You're, right. you're a one-upper, right? I think I this, is, this is the true story. My granddad, uh, <laughs> he, he believes that the, that the treasure was uh, dug up and moved somewhere in Cape Breton. And, and that all comes from uh, his, uh, in his childhood, he went there a few times with his best friend whose father was a treasure hunter on the island at one point. So it's, uh, I remember my granddad talking to me about it when I was like a little kid and I was talking about it in school at some point in elementary. I don't know if we, if in history class, they talked about it or if we just did like a, read a book or something. You read a book. I'll tell you. So <clears throat> this is, this is my introduction to it and I've been fascinated with it the rest of my life. So 1989, seventh grade language arts class, the, um, language arts teacher, Starts reading us a novel called the um, the Hand of Robin Squires. Okay. So this is a story about a young boy who follows his father from England to a small island off the coast of Nova Scotia. Of course, at the time that the teacher is reading us this story about a young boy on an adventure and pirate treasure and all these cool adventures, like. You know, this is before the internet when you still have an imagination and pirates, you know, are a thing that are real and the the notion of pirate treasure is real and you live on the ocean and so pirates were out there once upon a time and there could be treasure somewhere out there and your imagination is running wild. Teacher reads us his book and he says, all right, so do you guys like the book? Oh yeah, we love the book. What an awesome story. He goes, well, now what if I told you the island in this book is real. And it's like, what? Mind blown. And then he breaks out the Reader's Digest article. So in 1965, I believe, Jordan, there was an article published in the Reader's Digest about Oak Island. Yeah, I think that, I don't know if, it, if it's, that's the exact year, but it's right in that ballpark. And yeah, that that article really is what put the island, I guess, in the map of... Absolutely. Yeah, it's his. That article has sparked the um, passion for for many a treasure hunter. Um, a couple who will will talk about here shortly. But the the vice principal is like, all right, so yeah, cool story. The island is real, and apparently there's actually a treasure there. So he breaks out the, the Reader's Digest article, and my dad actually had that Reader's Digest at home. I got huh. I went home and told him about it, and he's like, yeah, I got that Reader's Digest with all my other Reader's Digest. And we started looking at it. And in this Reader's Digest article was a, for lack of a better word, a diagram of the money pit. So when you hear Oak Island, you hear money pit. Well, what is the money pit? So this is where the whole, the whole legend um, starts, where there's uh, Anthony Vaughn, um, Daniel McGinnis, and the third guy is like the fifth Beatle that no one can ever remember his name. McGinnis is the one who who is talked about the most because there's still a family connection for that McGinnis family to the island and there's a, a foundation from the home on the island. So the, the folklore, the legend goes that um, the locals were seeing lights on the island at night and um, some people went to investigate, were never seen again. A couple of years later, the uh, the three boys get in a dory and they cross over onto the island and they go around the back side of the island and they come to a clearing in the woods. And in this clearing is an oak tree and there's a limb on the oak tree that is sawn off and they can tell that something was hung from this limb once upon a time. One version of the story claims that there's still a rope and tackle there, or a tackle block hanging from the limb, which would be the stupidest thing in the world. It's like dig here. There's a tackle block and rope marks on the tree. Oh, and look at that. There's a depression in the ground. Yeah. All of this is legend. But as the legend goes, the boys saw the depression in the ground under the limb and they started to dig. They got down 10 feet and they struck a layer of oak uh, logs, a platform of oak logs. And they kept digging and every 10 feet they would come across another platform of oak logs. And somewhere along the way there was uh, clay and there was flagstone and maybe in the money pit there may have been some coconut fiber and eelgrass in there too depending on what version you listen to 
Yeah, definitely. And that's, uh, that's kind of the way the story goes is that there'd be every 10 feet, like a row of, of logs or timber. And mm-hmm. as w- and within that, there was the, um, the coconut fibers were almost like packed between the logs. Mm-hmm. Uh, as you got further down at greater depth. So they got to as far as they could get by themselves and they needed to get some more help. And then, you know, eventually, um, years go by, not too, too long after they get down to whether it's these three guys or one of the first treasure hunting companies that was formed, they get down to the 90 foot area, 90 foot level. They're down in this hole 90 feet deep. And, um, if you believe the story, a stone is found and it's referred to as the 90 foot stone and this stone was brought up and there was an inscription on it and the inscription was translated by a professor at Dalhousie University and it read 40 feet below two two million pounds are buried Mm -hmm. and um I don't believe in the 90 foot stone I believe the, the 90 foot stone was placed on display in the window of a Halifax book binding company. The stone is remarkably similar to the type of stone that is used for binding books. There's a very popular theory that the stone was a fake and it was just simply placed in the window of the Halifax book binding company to draw attention to the island so that they could sell shares in the business to raise more money to continue to um, bury or dig for, for the buried treasure. Now, the interesting thing about the 90 foot mark is that a booby trap was triggered when they made it to 90 feet. The next day, they resumed digging after finding the 90 foot stone. They put a man on a rope and they lowered him down into the pit and boop, into the water he goes. So they pull him up and they, they realize that the, the money pit has now flooded up to what, like the 30 foot mark or something like that? Mm hmm. It took some time to realize they tried pumping it, pump, 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 pump. And it, it was described as, as if they were trying to pump the ocean dry. Well, they actually were. Hmm. If you dig, so the, the island is divided into two types of bedrock. There's the granite type bedrock, like is found in the majority of Nova Scotia on one side. And the side where the money pit is, is anhydrite. And anhydrite, when it gets wet, it dissolves. And underneath that part of the island is just anhydrite. And if you, so, so the legend goes, if you dig a well anywhere on the money pit side of the island, you get fresh water. But the water in the money pit was salt water. So how is that? If there's pools of water underneath that part of the island, when they dig, why are they getting fresh water and not salt water? Um, why are they still digging at this point? Okay, so I, I've been following so far. They dug yep. up down to 90 feet because why not? Might as well dig a big hole. Mm-hmm. There was this tree here with a limb cut off, so let's go for it. <laughs> and now they get down to 90 feet. They found a stone, or maybe they didn't, and it's filling up with water. Like, why didn't they just like, why give not up? Give up? This, yeah, right. yeah. This because, does not be, seem like a good idea so far. So, yeah. So, um, I'll, around the island, Adriel, weird shit was being found. Stuff that should not be on an island in uh, Mahone Bay in uh, Nova Scotia. Too many weird things to make them um, decide to give up. Now, you don't know what you don't know. And throughout the decades, many things have been found that were not treasure hunting activity or treasure burying activity. But the people who found them didn't understand what they were looking at and assumed it was depositor activity some of it has been explained away through over the years um jordan you remember the crossbow bolt uh thing for crying out loud yeah um the uh what else is down there the holy grail is down there the uh, the spear that killed jesus is down there shakespeare's anyway. lost manuscripts are famous. that is there don't even how dare you that's <laughs> what it is anyway it's- but Oak Island, like what you find it when you when you really trace the history back, is the island and the people involved in it have a way of always being like one step away from this major discovery, and then they die. It's almost <laughs> like a disease. Every person who's ever been involved in it, they they are so obsessed. They lo- they either find the treasure or lose everything, and nobody's found the treasure yet. It's, True story. 
some people they say it's a money pit because maybe there's you know money and two million pounds of gold at the bottom of it, or right. it's a money pit because the amount of companies that were built up, heavily invested in, and just yep. spent everything. Well, they say it's Captain Kidd's treasure and Blackbeard's treasure and everybody who came up from the invasion down in um, Cuba yeah, and that's definitely those areas then yeah. come up, right? And they came up to, um, quote unquote, Canada. Yeah. Um, and let's this- save let's save the theories. Uh, okay. and Beat around what we think it is after we we cover the history a bit more. Okay. Um, so, Adriel, at this point, why did they keep going? Well, another company, I believe, it was the Onslow Company. They set up a drill. And they drilled down to a, uh, they might have gone to 240. And this is where the diagram in the OCA and the uh, Reader's Digest article comes from. They basically have drawn a diagram describing what this treasure company um, described that they drilled through. So the drill passed through different layers of things. Then eventually it, it went into what they described as a, a vault. And then it went through a layer of oak and then loose metal and another layer of oak and then loose metal, then another layer of oak. And then it like hit something solid. When they brought the drill bit up a couple of different times, things were found on the drill bit. Apparently um, the two most intriguing things that are recorded and only one of them still exists today, but the fact that that thing exists has what's kept my interest this entire time. Because it's we have it like it, it exists. It, it was in Dan Blankenship's basement every time I was on the island. Two things: one, three gold links, like a chain from a watch or something, were found on a drill bit. That's gone. No one knows where that is. So, did that even exist? Who knows? But another thing that was found on the auger was this small little speck of something that caught someone's attention. It's like that doesn't look like dirt. It was about the size of a pea. It was parchment, and when it was unrolled, the letters V and I were clearly visible on the parchment. Okay, what is that doing underground on Oak Island? And this whole this is what has led to the Shakespeare's uh, thing, but we'll come to that later. So, uh, what else, Jordan? After this, we we got a bunch of people who died. Uh, well, yeah, and and just the the particle that you you mentioned the Onslow Company. Like, what was happening at this point is. People would start a company and basically sell the mystery and find invested investors so they can get money to continue to dig. So the early history of this digging in in Oak Island story is all these companies being started and not having the technology to really dig down deep. So there's a whole series of that. And I guess that's kind of almost like Oak Island prehistory, but mm-hmm. most Oak Island story really starts with with the rest alls. Yep, and the rest dolls, and then um, before the uh, Triton group. Yeah, was, well, the rest dolls was basically it was. Um, it's the beginning of the modern, the modern it was like era, the modern age. Yeah. He was like a stuntman. I think he was an American stuntman. Yeah, him and his wife used to do the motorcycles in the cage. Yeah, and he he bought. I don't know if he bought the island or or a part of the island that contained the money pit. And he started doing digging and living on the island and, and kind of becoming a bit of like kind of like a rock star for what he was doing. Like I saw a lot of photos of him, you know, down in the dirt digging and whatnot. And people talk about the rest all tragedy, which is basically when he went to the island digging, I think this was in the early sixties. Mm-hmm. He, um, he, he was there with his wife and his children and they had some employees who were helping them dig. And there ended up being the, the first of several, not the first. The not the first. This, there was two. Two died before this. One guy. Yeah, and they I don't think know their who names he is. Are lost to history. One. Well, the first one's name is lost to history. The next one that died when the pump blew up, they have his name. Yeah, but with the rest alls, it was basically almost his whole family had had died. It. They don't know exactly what had happened, but it sounds like he uh, was overcome by toxic gas or toxic fumes. <laughs> I've heard two theories on this, but yeah, so they're down in the, they're down in the pit and he passes out. His son rushes down to get him and he passes out. And then another guy goes down and it takes a little while to clue in. Like there's, there's no, he was the canary in the coal mine. They shouldn't have been rushing down there without, you know, well, they didn't have respirators or anything. Mm -hmm. There's two, two theories that I've heard. One is, and this to me is the most plausible. They were running a pump. 
And the exhaust from a pump, the gas that it contains, and I always confuse them, carbon, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Which one is it? Carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide. monoxide. So it's very heavy. So it goes down, not up. So the carbon monoxide from the exhaust fumes from the pump that was right next to the shaft were going down into the shaft and polluting the air down there. Um, the other one was that they thought it was a natural gas within the earth that was released from the digging. Well, they've been digging down there often and hadn't been overcome. But on this day, that machine was running and they were overcome by fumes. So, um, yeah. How many died that day? Four? Four or five. Uh, Robert, his son, and... Two employees. Maybe it was four. Yeah, yeah but it's... Cyril hints. I'm looking it up as we go. Okay. Andy, Andy Dumont as well. Also, Cyril, Andy, and then and then and Robert, Robert, and his, and his son. Son, yeah, yeah, eighteen year old son. Okay. Um, yeah, they really they uh, uh, the son kept journals. All of this had been brought to the current owners of the island. They were really good stewards of the island. The next guy, though. They wanted the locals wanted him off. A lot of people were not happy with the next guy. The next guy was uh, um, Robert Dunfield. Dunfield. His yeah. plan is the same as the same. Is, is the first plan that I came up with was to do what Dan Blankenship did, and I didn't even realize that he had done this. I found out about it later on as an adult. I'm like, if it's flooded, just put a big pipe around it, keep the water out, and that's what he tried to do. But he didn't. Dan didn't do that, at, and we'll talk about 10, 10x later. Anyway, Dunfield. Dunfield's approach was my approach. Flatten it. Flatten the whole thing. Level the island down from the beach at sea level. Just don't dig down, stupid. Dig up. <laughs> you know, just level the whole thing. And uh, that's what he was trying to do. And he really, the problem with Dunfield's approach is any hope of an archaeological, well, I say that, but they're finding a fair amount of archaeological stuff, but everything he, has a question mark associated with it because his, the work he did was so destructive. Yeah. Geography of the Island that any history it. from before him, they, they can't really place where things were, or where things happened. So landmarks are lost. And yeah, even today, like the original site of the money pit where all this digging was happening, they're, they're not even entirely certain if, if nope. it's where they think it is. No. And the surface is not where the surface was in 1795, not by a long shot, right? That whole area is unconsolidated earth now, right? It's just been tore up and repacked and tore up and repacked. And oh, you just got a cat out there and he just, just pushed it all over just to see what he could find. Yep. He Beyond started that, too, yeah. he had the big, um, I don't even know what they're called, but you can see photos of overhead aerial photos of Oak Island during his dig. And it looks like a war zone. There's holes everywhere. The whole thing is demolished. Sweet. Yep. He should have found it, his, it then. He was mm. the first one to bring in real heavy equipment. He built the causeway. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So that he could transport, like you said, uh, before that, everything had to be on a barge, right? And uh, he, he constructed the causeway and was able to then bring in the real big guns. Not like we see now, though. Oh, man. They are really oh, yeah, Nothing big compared guns. to now, but no. to, but the work they're doing now, they're honoring the history, and they're very good. Yeah. For his was, yeah. I'm just, in his mind, he was so confident. He was going to just destroy the island, whatever, because tr- he's going to get the treasure. Yeah. But very quickly, uh, that didn't happen, and he ran out of money. Yep. And, I mean, he was also dealing with sabotage. The locals were pouring sugar in his gas tanks and all kinds of stuff. They did not like his approach. They were, you know, he was uh, he was destroying it. Um, well, the, the but, causeway he built alone caused a lot of locals. Oh, yeah. Much longer uh, ride to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, ridiculous. Um, so we're into the modern era now. And after him come along two of the most famous treasure hunters to be on Oak Island in recent years. And that's Fred Nolan and Dan Blankenship. So Dan came in just after around the same time as, um, uh, Dunfield Mm -hmm. and started the Triton company. And Nolan tried to get involved in that. And they basically told him the pound sand Nolan, um, not one to, um, shy from a fight or take no for an answer uh unbeknownst to them 
went and secretly bought a bunch of lots on the island that they did not know were unowned or for sale. And he really threw a wrench in the monkey works. Don't think that's the correct expression. So he um, he, he certainly um, caused problems for them because he, he restricted access to parts of the island, all that stuff. Fred Nolan was a surveyor by trade and surveyed the island and again found all kinds of crazy stuff and the craziest thing he found adriel was something that became known as nolan's cross there are five boulders huge boulders that i don't think like it makes no this is this is a true true mystery on oak island the geometry of this cross is perfect there are, and in the center where the cross intersects there was a, a stone that was actually buried. It was way too perfect to be um, not man-made, but the stones are so huge that it doesn't, I don't know how anyone could have placed them there. Yeah, like Nolan, um, he was like an obsessive surveyor. So he basically surveyed the top, like the entire island in kept markings of where prominent features were like certain stones and rocks and trees and depressions. And he had these, his drawings were like, look like the ramblings of a lunatic where he yep. was just mapping everything, looking for, to make connections between things. But he ended up finding across, across the island through these four boulders that seemed out of place. And it's, you know, there's been theories upon theories based on, you know, what Nolan's cross means or what, or, or is it an arrow pointing in a direction or, you know, is it something left behind from the Knights Templar? Like it, it goes on forever. Yeah, I love the um, the theory that um, Peter Amundsen came up with that it's part of the Tree of Life. So the Tree of Life is a bunch of dots, and every dot has a name, and it it's, it's has a biblical meaning and stuff. Um, tied into constellations and swan, stuff like that. Uh, his movie, Peter Amundsen's movie, uh, Shakespeare, The Hidden Truth, what an incredible documentary. Um, absolutely amazing. And the, his theory is that uh, um, all Shakespeare's folios are a treasure map to the, uh, the treasure, King Solomon's treasure, and that it's on Oak Island. I'll sum that up real quick. Um, Jordan, why don't you bring us through Dan Blankenship and 10X? Yeah, so basically, and this is cool because this I didn't know this story until I interviewed Dan Blankenship's son, David, on my podcast. And, and David basically told the story of how his dad got involved in the treasure hunt. And basically, like when the Restalls, we had talked about them dying earlier, when the Restalls were on the island, this article was written in, uh, in Reader's Digest that we talked about earlier. And it was centered a lot around the Restalls and this crazy, you know, group of circus performers that are digging for treasure and whatnot. But anyway, uh, Dan Blankenship, this guy from the U.S., um, had read the the article in Reader's Digest and kind of became obsessed and thought I contractor think, in Florida. Yeah, contractor who had a special, like a specialty in like kind of metal fabrication and whatnot. And he thought, much like every other treasure hunter involved in this, he thought he had this like unique set of skills that he could maybe solve the mystery and dig down and get the treasure. So he decided basically to get like his son who was like 16 or something at the time and his lawyer and get in the car and drive to Nova Scotia to basically knock on the doors on Oak Island and see if they can get involved. Um, they went, met with the rest dolls. The rest dolls weren't interested in finding a partner or anything. So the blanket ship man, Dan, his son and their lawyer basically turn around and they start driving back to, uh, back to the U S and while on the way in a hotel, they, um, they got a call basically saying like, did you hear what just happened on Oak Island? Like people you just met with, you know, a few days back there, you know, there was a, a tragedy. There was an accident. They're all dead. And he basically got back in the car and turned around to go back to Nova Scotia to try to make a deal with whoever's going to take ownership of the Island, which happened to be Robert Dunfield, who we talked about destroying it. So basically Robert Dunfield, Dan Blankenship and Fred Nolan, the surveyor, they ended up kind of, all together forming a bit of a syndicate to to do the the treasure hunting. Fred Nolan's work, the surveyor, mainly focused on what was on top of the ground. He was a surveyor, so he was doing these elaborate mappings and trying to make connections like what he found with Nolan's cross. Obsessed what, with the swamp. 
Yeah, and what Dan Blankenship decided to do was look more so under the ground. So he found a site that was of interest to him. <sighs> he, he found the site was doing uh, dowsing. The name dowsing, where you have basically two sticks. <laughs> Charlatan. You and, yeah, you walk around until you get a bit of a you know some kind of feeling, and people used to use that as like yeah, fine right. oil or water and where to dig a well. But anyway, Dan Blankenship firmly believed in it. And he was walking around dowsing with dowsing rods and finding different spots that he wanted to dig. Um, he named them all. So, you know, 1A, 1B, 1C. Turned out that the one that, re- and once he would name them all and mark them, they would um, basically drill down and get a core sample and see what was down there and if it was worth pursuing. But it ended up that not 1A, not 1B, it ended up being 10X. <laughs> that was uh, what really became legendary and and you know 10x is the name for a bullseye right oh is it no I didn't. oh yeah that's that name is not a coincidence like in archery and other uh shooting sports the mm-hmm. perfect bullseye the best score you can get on a target face is 10x interesting mm. um when he dug down there with the the to, to kind of feel out what was in the in the spot they they dug through a bunch of earth like you'd expect a little bit of bedrock, which you would expect under the earth, but then they found a huge cavity. Uh, his idea was, you know, what's in this cavity? I want to get down there and figure it out. You know, Kel told me that he had to actually dynamite his way into that. Oh, really? Yeah. I believe it. Yeah. And, and Dan Blankenship, like in this story, there's the, the thing about it is there's no stopping this guy. Basically what he did without having too much money he dug down as far as he could by hand and, or well, with shovels and whatnot, and using concrete around the hole he was digging as a way to prevent it from collapsing in on him. But uh, that wasn't enough. And when they got down far enough, it ended up basically collapsing in on him. And his son had to pull him out of the hole. I don't know how far he was down. I think it was like 80 feet or something. Yeah, he was way down there. And um, there's actually audio recording of this incident. Um, it's been played probably on the show or in some documentary. Dave's on the top running the crane and Dan is down in the hole. And above his head, he starts hearing this like ominous sound and it's not good. So he's up, 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 get me up. And no sooner did Dave pull him up. He had the he had the the lining of 10x at this time or the hole lined with steel casing. Mm. And it ruptured from the pressure of the water pushing against it. It just wasn't thick enough and strong enough for the job and it ruptured and collapsed just as he was pulled up. That yeah. piece of casing is still on the island. I've seen it. I've seen it as well, yeah. And Crazy. so that um, they needed to continue to get down there. He wasn't uh, scared away from this. So No, no. He did one of my favorite parts of this whole story, and just kind of a statement to his ingenuity, was he um, he found for sale in Dartmouth, outside of Halifax, uh, a couple used oil tankers, like train cars that were railroad cars. Yeah, yeah. So he, I think there's three or four of them he bought, and basically what he did was he just sat it on top of his wall. Just think about that for a second. How did he get them to the island to begin with? Like you yeah. know the. The man was, like you said, relentless. He buys three oil tankers, like train cars, in Dartmouth and then brings them to the island. That in itself is a feat by any standards today yeah, or then. It's just crazy. To, but what he ended up doing was he put he put a kind of butt end on the hole and dug around it. So the weight of the oil tanker would just slowly slide itself into the ground. Once it got down there, they would go inside it, hollow it out, reinforce it, put another one up on top. And just continue to dig around it so the things just under their own weight kind of sink down into the hole he had already started as a way to basically a really cheap and easy way to add some heavy reinforcement to the line it yeah yeah and it's uh so anyway he ended up um getting the these rail cars basically got him down to the bedrock they hollowed out there and he and scuba gear with not with modern equipment at all swam down into that uh that empty void he was trying to get at and there's been a lot of ideas with the video camera yeah he had a video camera strapped to him some of the worst quality video but it does appear to show like you know maybe bones maybe tools maybe a treasure chest mm. there's a lot of imagination used to 
uh, like the Rorschach test, you know, where you see the ink spot. It's oh, awesome. this is this is where John Frick on the uh, Oak Island Facebook pages drives me crazy. He takes screenshots of stuff. He's like, "Oh, I see this, and I see that, and I see this." And oh, yeah, you, but only you, man. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, this um, this adventure. So and let's. Um, lay out here where 10x is in relation to the money pit let's this is a new hole this is not the money pit this is not where the oak platform was every 10 feet this is not where it got flooded with water yes the cavity down below is filled with water and it's also salt water um, but this is not to, to be confused with the money pit area this is a new fresh hole that dan dug and um i don't know jordan i think um all for nothing. He spent his whole life chasing 10x mm -hmm. and um, convincing other people there was stuff in 10x. And I had never heard the term salting a mine before until I heard 10x. Are you familiar with the term salt a mine? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a big part of Oak Island's history. Is sure is. Yeah. People like I guess the those of the more skeptical mind uh, believe that a lot of the main parts of the story are the result of mines being salted. Yeah, so for the listeners who may not be aware of that old-timey term, let's say I've got a gold mine for sale. Well, ain't no point in selling the gold mine doesn't produce gold, so I'll plant some gold in it for the buyer to find. So, And then, well, uh, it's a productive gold mine. Let's buy it. And uh, yeah, so Dan made lots and lots of claims about 10X. And um, talk about some of the things that he claimed to have pulled out of 10X, would you? you use your imagination, but a lot of it is, is simple things like just pieces of metal. Um, yeah, no gold, no gold, but chain just, link. Yeah. Just, just small like wire metal yeah. found way too deep in the earth to be placed there naturally. Cause we're talking, you know, like over a hundred feet underground, mm. but like just a, a scrap of metal is like really, you know, really interesting, but people who are skeptical of Dan Blankenship will, uh, there was a period of time after his work was done where he was trying to sell his ownership of the island. And he made several statements to the press that, you know, he's on the cusp of a big discovery. He wants to sell it to someone that will help, that will help him reveal like the secret he's just about to get to. Some people think he was involved in the mine salting, but some people also think he may have just found a, a natural, um, uh, a, a natural depression where, I can't think what the term is, but where the earth is kind of a recycled sinkhole. Yeah. Like a natural sinkhole. And he's just finding old parts of ships that have sunk there, you know, in prehistory. But some people think that 10 X was created when he blew his way into it. Yeah. So, so 10 X uh, has been scanned with the latest, greatest technology. And so the first scan, Oh, a body. There's supposed to be a body down there. So when he his video shows what appears to be a chest, some tools leaning up against a wall. Oh, a wooden post. Remember the wooden pillar? Mm -hmm. It's a it's a, a steel casing from a previous dig that they put there themselves, and then all of a sudden they they mistake it uh, for a wooden post. It's not a wooden yeah, like post they, at all. They were finding things they dropped trying to get that right. Yeah. yeah. So Dan Chatterton actually dove in 10X multiple times. He got in that cavity and felt his way around, and there's absolutely nothing man-made down there whatsoever. Um, it's just silt and rock covered in just silt. A, yeah, just a natural cavity under the, under the ground. And I have a, a piece of a core sample that was given to me of um, – from that area of the island that was dug, I think it was like a hundred, it was from about 140 feet below. It's, it's like, it looks like almost like a wine cork. Mm -hmm. um, but to give you an idea of what's under the ground, it's like this wine cork, it almost feels like a piece of like rock salt or something. Like I'm sure if I drop it. It's anhydrite. Yeah, yeah I'm sure I, if I, I have drop a piece it in a cup. It, too. it yeah, would like dissolve, a, yeah. Yeah, that's what I think. Like if I drop this in, in water right now, I'd go back in an hour and it would just be cloudy water with a rock. Yep. Yeah, and uh, it makes sense that this island is just peppered with natural formations. Yeah, because yeah, exactly. the bedrock dissolves. By yeah, um, when I took the private tour two years ago, we met up with Rick. He was working on the uh, on the garden over um, 
and built around that shaft. Yeah, yeah. And he gave us each a piece of uh, bedrock taken from uh, the money pit area and he autographed it and stuff. It was really awesome. Yeah. So, okay. 10 X. Yeah. Um, interesting, but I don't believe it was ever anything other than Dan. Um, Dan, Dan lived a charmed life. He basically got paid to be a treasure hunter. Mm -hmm. So in order to keep people paying, you know, keep the, the, the paycheck rolling, keep the investments coming. He had to, he had to find stuff and, and that's, that was 10 X and, uh, not, not a 10 X fan believer whatsoever. Um, I, I'm, I'm quite uh, skeptical about 10 X, but at the same time, I think Dan Blankenship is, Although, like, rest in peace, he's deceased now. But he is um, was bitten by the Oak Island bug. Like, he was obsessed, and this was the man's life. He spent a yep, lot, hundred you know, percent, fifty years of his, his family, life. his wife, his his mm -hmm. son David moved up there. He's still there. Yeah. Yep. And it's this became this guy's life, and I don't think he was doing it for monetary gain or fame. Like, I think he was just just like Fred Nolan. I think he was just obsessed with the mystery. Um, yeah, so that's, that's my theory on it, but 10 X, like there was, I think there was just, he was finding enough that had him convinced. And it was the kind of thing you see it in the documentaries and the TV show that was made of this. I think, I don't think there's anyone in the world who could have told Dan Blankenship, there's nothing down there and he would have believed them. He was so hell bent on. Oh yeah. Cause he, he, he did find legitimate artifacts around the Island not mm. just in 10 X. Right. Um, there's a lot of weird stuff's been found. The H O stone, a stone on the Island with inscription and carvings that no one was able to decipher the stone triangle, the, um, stones with the, with the holes drilled in them for maybe using for surveying and measurement. Um, the you know, Spanish scissors, the hidden wharf, um, before we move into the Michigan group and the Lagina brothers, why don't you talk about Smith's Cove? Yeah, Smith's Cove. Like, what's cool about Oak Island, there's a, there's a few kind of, it's only a small little island. You can walk the perimeter of the whole thing in probably a couple hours. Um, not a big island, but it manages to have these really interesting places. One, and this is my favorite one, so I'm glad you asked me to do this. Me too. I love Smith's Cove. Yeah, Smith's Cove is... Just a basically the the shoreline of the island near the money pit, and what makes Smith's, Smith's Cove interesting is when the money pit was being dug. Trevor talked about how it would always it was refilling with seawater. Kind of the theory was that whoever booby trapped it and designed it as a way to hide the treasure and whatnot, they must have had tunnels kind of dug from the spot where the treasure was, extending out underground to the sea, so that way water could you know, flow through these tunnels or drains and go to the underneath the money pit and, you know, and flood the thing to keep people from finding the treasure. Uh, so a lot of the early digging was being done, that was being done was looking for these tunnels to block them, to prevent the water from getting to the money pit so they could dig the money pit. The belief was that I think what they had done was they put like this really strong dye test. Yeah. Yeah. Dye. And they poured it in the area around the money pit and they looked from above around the island to see where the dye went out. And well, that the Michigan guys did this. The pre, the first dye test, they would have just been out on a boat looking to see where the dye came out. Yes, that's right. Yeah, but regardless, it was they coming out near Smith's Cove. So, kind of the belief was these drains that were funneling water from the ocean under the island into into the area, the money pit, were coming out at Smith's Cove, and that led to a lot of digging, excavating, and basically in the beach and just like a lot of cool discoveries there. They were finding a lot of interesting things and it's just a, it's just a cool spot. I find having been to the island a few times for tours, when I go to Smith's Cove, it's like I feel like I'm going to a magical place. Well, I told you, I tell you about the time I was, um, it's the only time, and I guess I figured out what it was, it's the closest mm -hmm. I've ever come to a paranormal experience in my life. It happened on Oak Island. It happened in Smith's Cove. And there's all kinds of ghost stories about Oak Island and technology doesn't work and electronics crap the bed and, and um, there you, weird things happen at night, all this stuff. So we're on our tour and uh, tour's almost done. Um, 
we're with Charles. It's a private tour. Charles has another tour coming up. And when he brought us to Smith's Cove, he was like, don't look down there. You don't see that stuff. This was the cofferdam going in. Cofferdam was in, and they had done the first excavation of Smith's Cove after the cofferdam went in. They wouldn't let us go down <clears throat> because of the TV show and all that stuff, right? We weren't supposed to see any of the stuff before you see it on TV. Rick, on the other hand, says, did you go to Smith's Cove? I was like, ah, Charles wouldn't let us. He goes, what? Go. Poof, like I was being chased by a pack of wild dogs. I was gone, man. I didn't give him a chance to hesitate. I ran down the Smith's Cove, and they were yelling at me going, Trevor, he said don't take any pictures. I'm like, yeah, no problem. <laughs> I took pictures. Yeah, I've, I've anyway, taken a couple of handfuls of rocks from there, too, I admit it. I get down there. I'm checking stuff out. And I'm kind of, like, I mean, I'm down where the cofferdam is. Like, I'm in Smith's Cove, standing where they found the wharf and stuff, right? They just hadn't found it yet. Something, I'm standing next to an oil drum, probably with fuel for a bobcat or something. Anyway, that thing goes, bong! Like someone was standing next to it and smacked it with a bat. And I looked over and I was like, what the hell is that? That's awesome. There's nobody here. There's nobody around. That that drum just got smoked by something. And then I was like, I got myself convinced that it was just a contraction or expansion from the heat or some, you know what I mean? There's some natural scientific explanation for that drum making noise. Anyway, it was uh it was kind of cool. Um, uh, so talk about what was found in Smith's Cove that uh, doesn't grow in Nova Scotia and has no business being there. Yeah. So think about this is if you, anyone who's ever done dealt with like uh, drainage and such on your property is like, if you dig a bunch of tunnels um, leading from a beach underneath an Island, the tunnels are very quickly going to fill up with sand and debris and rock in your tunnel is just going to become useless very quickly. Uh, so what they found around Smith's Cove was an incredible amount of coconut fiber. And for anyone listening, who's not from Atlanta, Canada, coconuts don't grow in Nova Scotia. And when I say an incredible amount, like they found a ton of this stuff, not the type that would wash up willy nilly. So kind of the theory that still holds today is that, Coconut fiber was likely or could have been used as a way to prevent or filter filtration yeah. to prevent like sand and debris from getting into the uh, into the drains that were built. And because a lot of like when you talk about the history of Oak Island, there's always this question of whether it's natural anomalies in the ground that are being found or is it something of intelligent design and man made. So kind of the coconut fibers being used as filters for these drains speak to it being something man-made and then you know if you agree that it's something man-made why did man build this incredible thing or what were they hiding and then that just you know sucks you into the uh mystery yeah now they say the skeptics will say coconut fiber was everywhere coconut mm -hmm. fiber was a packing peanut of the 18th century that's what we packed our goods in when we shipped them across the ocean we use coconut fiber so it's it's all over the world even though there's no coconuts growing in that region you're going to find coconut fiber but like like you said jordan uh not in that not in that quantity and not in that concentration in that location yeah. right like it was mm -hmm. like a blanket of it and so it seems very possible that it was there as a filtration now it's possible that it was, um, there was other things happening on the island. There's a whole tar kiln theory. There's, a, you know, someone can come on and say, listen, this was also happening on the island and it was actually used for this and had nothing to do with treasure hunting. And that's where I keep coming back to you don't know what you don't know. And over the years, things have been mistaken for treasure uh, burying activity. And someone comes along with a uh, with a more realistic, logical explanation, Ockram's razor, and explains it away. And that's happened a few times. Um, the crossbow bolts, for example, PV points found in logs, and idiots thinking that they're Roman crossbow bolts. Give me a break. There was a sawmill on the island. Those are PV points. Anyway. <clears throat> All right. So... Um, that let's talk about the most recent activity and then we'll transition into our theories of what, if anything is there and who put it there. 
Yeah. So 2007, 2008, I believe, the Michigan that group. Park. Yeah. yeah, because I took a tour of Oak Island. I was in Halifax for the Canadian Archery National Championships, and I had never been to Oak Island. It was a bucket list item for me, legit. Like, I've been fascinated with this since seventh grade. And I said to my wife, uh, all right, the Nationals are over. We don't, you know, we're on summer vacation. Let's go. Let's take a drive. I don't care if I just stand on a beach and look at it. Uh, I just want to say that I've at least seen it. So we drive up to the causeway and we see the signs, no trespassing, blah, blah, blah. Then we head over to the hotel, um, go to the marina, and I don't see like a rent-a-boat, go-around Oak Island type situation set up. So we go into the hotel. The hotel uh, was called the Oak Island Resort. Now it's been changed to the Atlantica for some reason. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, I go to the front desk. I'm looking for some information about the island. They're like, oh, no way. Well, guess what? Today, for the first time since 1995, the Friends of the Oak Island group are putting on a tour. I'm like, what? You should have seen this place, man. It was, they had just been on the island like the day before, cutting the grass and opening up the trails, and they were waiting for the insurance to go through. Anyway, it was Charles. Charles uh, Barcos was doing the tour. I was on this kid, like uh, I was on him like a fat kid on a Smarty. I followed him. Or I was His shadow wasn't as close to him as I was. Like I was just attached to him at the hip and hanging off of every word. I was just in my heaven and glo I was in my glory. Anyway, um, he mentioned then about the quote-unquote Michigan group. A bunch of uh, interested parties from Michigan had purchased the island and were doing some test digging. And uh, lo and behold, couple of years later, what do we get? The Curse of Oak Island TV show with Rick and Marty Lagina. Okay, so they're bringing science technology um, to the Camera island. Crews. Oh, yeah, everything. Um, they're traveling the world, trying to track down um, theories. So the show involves two things, showing a little bit of digging uh, footage and a little bit of, let's listen to this nut job and his latest theory. And let's go follow the Knights Templar and let's go follow Shakespeare. And so everybody comes to the show with a theory and they entertain them. And then they, you know, thank you. It's nice. You know, see you later. Um, and they get their 15 minutes of fame. Um, what have they found some cool stuff? I'm going to tell you what I think is the coolest thing that's happened since they've been involved. And I want you to tell us what you think the coolest thing has happened. And I'm going to let you go first. Um, what is the coolest thing? That has happened or found since they got involved, in your opinion. So for me, the coolest thing that's happened really, and it's it's weird to say, but maybe it adds context, is like growing up when I was I was always interested in Oak Island. I remember hearing like there's going to be a TV show about it and I'd just being blown away because so much of what was like what was happening on Oak Island was stuff that you had to like read old books and stuff to to learn about never could you really like see it all going down. So like, I think the most amazing thing for me has just been the camera crew being there and being to kind of look over the shoulder of a treasure hunter. Like if this show had been on when I was a kid, like I was so hooked on Oak Island, then I would have just blown my mind. So I think just the most, the best part of it is just seeing it as far as what they found. Honestly, just like Oak Island always has, it's they always just find nothing too amazing, but just enough to be like, whoa, that's really weird. Like, what's going to happen next? So it's been something as simple as we talked about 10X. They managed to get down there and basically prove that it, there's not much to it. Like, I think that's the biggest development in the story. Like, Yeah, even if, even if when all this is done, they prove that it was never anything there. Good, fine. I'm all right. You know? Uh, just we want answers, yeah. And maybe it's a treasure. Maybe it's a treasure, and it's and it's been long since um, discovered and gone. Um, or maybe there was never anything there, and everything was just always mistaken for something it wasn't. And imaginations ran wild. I think like the, a lot of a lot of the stuff you guys are talking about just sounds like weird and coincidental. It doesn't sound like stuff that makes sense for like pirates to do, like digging the trap with the with the water. It's like they would have found the tunnels at this point, right? If, if that, yeah. that one guy with the bulldozers who like bulldozed they the whole thing, yeah. he would have they found have. something. He would have found like, oh, weird. There's like tunnels made of concrete, like crappy concrete or wood or something like that. 
Um, because like yeah, the pirates would have had to have had a way to like shut that off so that they can rig it. And like ninety feet for a tunnel, like that's a serious tunnel to put some gold at the bottom of. You'd never oh, be able to get to much... it. Okay, so a couple of things. So um, the flood tunnels have been found possibly twice, if you believe the people who say they found them. Um, pirates had nothing to do with this because pirates didn't have the technology to pull this off. Uh, this was way too big of an operation, possibly military. Aliens. About, like you said, a Aliens. obviously, obviously. <laughs> Same ones that built the pyramids. Um, now, there there are a couple of things that have been found that we haven't discussed yet that that uh, should blow your mind, but I, I probably not. So, like what? Um, okay, so... Guns. Jordan, yes. the coolest thing... Yeah, actually, they did find guns. They found really? all kinds of... Uh, yeah, they find musket balls, and they find parts of flintlocks, and they found a cap gun that belonged to one of the Restall kids. Um, so, Jordan, for you, the coolest thing in recent years is the fact that the show exists and we can follow um, the, uh, the searchers. I, and they managed to get down to 10x. Like that was that was, that, when that episode happened, and they had a diver down there with professional equipment filming. We can't talk about 10x and getting down there without talking about Fat Indy. Oh my goodness! Here we go. Yo Vaughn, I'm off the show. Yo, Yo Vaughn Pulitzer. Oh, you should tell your whole Pulitzer story, man. It's not uh, even I've had worth it. Eh? Weirdos with my show when Pulitzer's one of them, but uh, I haven't had the wonder, dealings with him that others have. That's for sure. I wonder if he wears gloves, just like he's. But <laughs> he's he's as crazy as glove guy. That's oh, a whole other go. thing. If listen, listeners, if you don't listen to the nighttime podcast, one, you're a communist. Two, <laughs> start with Glove Guy. Go find the Glove Guy episodes and just start there, and then go on to um, Tonada or Tonetta. Tonetta, yeah, you're yeah, you became. <sighs> well, I you hated know, it I didn't all tell you this. I, I, Tonetta's a, a musician. This old man, a, a senior citizen from Toronto, who spends his entire life writing very sexually explicit music recording himself dancing and singing it and putting it on YouTube. But uh, I did a two part episode about him. The second part, he came on as a guest, but as a thank you, he liked the episodes. He sent me a package in the mail and uh, this was after the episode. So I didn't put this out, but the package, it had a bunch of, I opened it. It's this big disturbing package with big black markers. It's like from Tanetta inside. It's a bunch of pins with his face on them. Um, but there was a, a CD that said rare Tanetta and a CD that said nasty Tanetta. Uh oh. I put them in my computer and it wasn't music. It wasn't CD. It was like DVD of like a, a files or whatever. So uh -oh. I, the first one was rare Tanetta and it was all these videos of him, like, you know, in the 80s doing the same thing he's doing now, just as a man. And I was like, whoa, these are all these, you know, there was probably a hundred videos there I've never seen. I was like, this is cool. Then I'm like, nasty Tanetta, what could this be? Maybe it's like really nasty songs. And I put it in and I learned that if Tanetta says nasty, it is very nasty. And it was basically just a, a collection of, you know, what? Uh, no, stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If he thinks it's nasty, it's nasty. Take his word for it. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, I can't unsee. No, I was going to say, you can't unsee that, buddy. That's burned into <laughs> your, oh, dude. So if you ever want to come over, Trevor, we can watch it. Oh, yeah. When I, next time I'm in town, I definitely <laughs> want to see it because I'm a sucker for fun. It's a train wreck. You can't not look, right? Yeah. Anyway, okay. So back to... Um, we'll we'll was, talk that about... That was a sidebar. So you're talking about your favorite... We'll talk discovery. about Pulitzer when we talk about Swordgate. Oh, you got it right there. Of course. Um, first, I want to talk about the coolest thing that I think has happened so far. And uh, so, yeah, let's do this. I'm going to talk about the coolest thing that's happened so far, in my opinion, that they found. Then let's talk about the crazy dumb shit that we've had to t put up with, like Jovan Pulitzer, um, some, and then uh, some crazy dumb theories, and then we can maybe beat around our own theories and then answer some questions. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so as I said earlier, the thing that kept me hooked all these years was that piece of parchment, that piece of parchment, Adriel, that came off of a drill bit that we still have, that has its parchment, its animal skin, um, it's underground on an island in, in Nova Scotia, and it's got two letters written on it. Okay, that's cool. Not as cool as what they found a couple of years ago. In the Money Pit area, they brought up more bookbinding material, more parchment. It has 
pigments on it. That's all awesome. But nowhere near as awesome as bone, human bone. Human bone from deeper than 140 feet. The bone was carbon dated to somewhere between the 15 or 14 and 1500s. So that's cool. So not only is it bone, it's very, very old bone. Well, then they did DNA testing on it. One of the bones DNA tested to the uh, Great Britain area and the other one to the Middle East. So we've got two different people, two different sets of remains that carbon date between 14 and 1500 underground on Oak Island. And the DNA test put them in Europe and Asia. Why? How? That, I mean, can you buy ancient remains and salt to mine? Probably. But I think that's a stretch. So it's not treasure, but it's way the hell out of place. It's way deep underground, deeper than anybody should have been able to bury stuff. In... I wonder, like, if you dug in some weird spot, like, I don't know, some other island, some Polynesian, maybe not Polynesian island, some island closer to, like, where people would have been. I wonder if you'd find weird stuff. If you just dug to the extent that these guys did, would you find like, oh, weird, we found a bone of some person in here. That's That shouldn't be there, but it is. Because like some of this stuff is like, it seems coincidental. Some of it seems like these guys are just desperate and they want other people to invest in their passion. And uh, so they put a bunch of weird stuff in there every, every once in a while and try the to get more people to invest. these guys, Adriel? In. Investment is not a motive for these guys. Marty Lagina made his fortune in the oil and gas industry in the United States. He's independently wealthy. The TV show is also providing funding. They don't need any outside investment. Mm -hmm. he, can, he can buy and sell us all day. So he's doing it for, like, Rick is the one that's in love with this. Marty is the skeptic. Marty and Rick are partners in this. And, uh, you know, Marty and the TV show are paying the bills. And they started it before the, without the TV show, and they'll continue to do it when the TV show mm -hmm. pulls the plug because it's not getting enough ratings. So that looks like a long ways away because the TV show is still very successful. Uh, but man, this season was just about 100 percent scripted. I didn't, I didn't find there was any natural uh, flow to the conversations at all. It's just, it's, it's. It's turned into a hardcore scripted reality TV show. What are they, what are they even doing these days? They're like, like I would imagine there's there's a couple different ways. You could either like plow the thing, which it sounds like a guy did and and didn't get anywhere, or you could dig a bunch of holes, like little pilot holes and bore holes, and like they try did to that. They did the pilot holes. They put a camera down. They saw something looked interesting, and then they come in with these huge caissons. They, um, they're the same idea. It's the modern day version of what Dan Blankenship did with the railroad cars where he sunk them down into the ground Case to keep the water yeah. out. So, yeah. yeah, so this got this huge oscillator that just sinks these huge caissons down. Then they dig it all up and they go through the spoils to see what's there. Mm -hmm. And they st and they're, st and they're finding stuff. They found uh, a military uniform button down there. All kinds of crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there's a Oak Island exhibit at the um, Natural History Museum in downtown Halifax with um, the this stuff that they have found on display there. Some really cool things. Plus the museum, the uh, island itself has a museum. So, okay. So with the TV show comes special guests that come on and, and do theories. And you can't talk about the show without talking about the charlatan a hustler, scam artist, um, Jovan Pulitzer. That's his new stage name. What's his real name, uh, Jordan? I wouldn't dare even say it for fear of uh, legal recourse. Oh, I'll well, <laughs> say it. What the hell is that fat bastard's name? <laughs> oh, <laughs> we have we no. Go. I'm just. I just want to preface this by saying we have no money. <laughs> Look so up. <laughs> If you want, so his one of his first big follies was Q cat. If you look okay. up the whole. Oh, -cat I hear that. Book, right, <laughs> I remember those this, things. Yeah, this is the guy. It. Oh, really? Huh. This is the guy. He reinvented himself as a wannabe treasure hunter. He claims to have published more books than I think anybody. Oh, uh, I yeah. yeah yeah yeah. Okay. Come on, Jordan. Just... What's, what's his name? 
I can't think of it, but it's needless to say, this is a guy who has a lot of money and is uh, very litigious. Yeah. He's also mentally ill. He's a complete and total sociopath. Jovan Filia? Yeah, that that may, maybe that's his real name. What was he was he going by Jovan Pulitzer on the show? Well, no, well, yeah, he was going going by uh, uh, something Pulitzer. Hutton J. Pulitzer. Hutton J. Pulitzer. That was his oh, new that's stage what you were name. Looking for. Okay, I thought you meant but his that. real name is Jovan Filway or whatever. Yeah, and or he calls himself the Commander as well. Right, Treasure Force. Yeah. Oh man, he wanted his own TV show so bad. Um, so he bad. Had, I he had a lot of beef with show he was on the show for a short amount of time he was on the show for for a long time actually he was on a ton of episodes he spent like the whole summer on the island he went to kill's wedding wow yeah crazy uh, yeah, anyway so him and kill aren't friends he, he's not friends with anybody he's psycho you can't be friends with him he's psychotic anyway he's on the island and the island is approached this is one of the most ridiculous things. It's really egg on the face for the show. But when I showed up with my sword, they they laughed it off. I didn't show it to Rick, but I showed it to Charles. I brought Charles aside and I opened up my bag. I said, Charles, is it cool if I have this here? You should have seen his face. Charles is the one that brokered the deal. Met the guy in the parking lot. It was like a drug deal. All right. So with the TV show comes a lot of people who come to the island uh, with theories about what's going on. And it makes for good TV. It's so it's like the, the treasure hunting equivalent of like Dragon's Den. You like show up and present your theory and they either like laugh you off or give you a little bit of time. <laughs> it really is very, very reminiscent of that. So so somebody approaches them and and, and claims that uh, a member of their family was trolling for scallops uh, near Oak Island and they discovered a shipwreck that's probably Roman and they brought up this Roman artifact this roman sword with hercules on the hilt right he's got a lion's mane on or skin on and a log over his head and stuff and a little pp right there and two standing on two lines <laughs> so this one was made from the same mold you can tell by the markings here some science was done on it um that was that appeared on the show so they spent no kidding ten thousand dollars to get their hands on this sword that was claimed to have been pulled out of the water near Oak Island. It is nothing but a 1970s tourist trinket from Pompeii, probably. It's got fake patina on it and everything. So um, there's one theory, Jordan, that the producers did all this simply to discredit Hutton because they knew it was fake, but they did it all just just so that he could run with it Wow. And they were going to let him run with it and then pull the plug and make him look like an idiot. If so, that's like the ultimate troll move. It is. And I think I, I think there's some there's some truth to it. So Hutton said he had this um, fancy pants scanner, which um, he lied about how it works. It would just scan the surface and basically just tell you that this is uh, fake patina paint. But he was talking about the composition of the metal, and this thing was real, and it was magical, and he was going to write a white paper, and you could buy access to the white paper. The white paper, by the way, still waiting for it. Any day now, Hutton? Where's the white paper, buddy? The peer-reviewed white paper proving that this is a real Roman artifact. This thing completely destroyed his credibility. Now, here's how I got involved in the story. Love this. The day the show came on... Or the day after, maybe it was the day after. I'd have to look at the newspaper because I, I photographed this on the newspaper. Anyway, it was in December. It was right around Christmas time. Um, I think it was right after the show aired. They were claiming that this it, the show the sword hadn't been debunked yet on the show. That's what it was. But they were gonna they were gonna get the sword. Sure as shit, one popped up on eBay, identical <laughs> to the one on this on the on the show. So I bought it. There's a professor, uh, Andy White, from the um, University of North Carolina, who is a professor of archaeology, who was all about um, ruining Hutton's credibility and, and just completely blowing this whole thing up and coined the phrase Swordgate and was tracking down these swords all over the place and having them sent to him and doing testing. So 
So I actually mailed my sword to him where he did all kinds of 3D scans and stuff, compared it to the one on the show. He was grouping them into different types. This is a J type, and it's based on the mold they come out of. And the mold they come out of is based on these marks, like this mark right here kind of looks like the letter J. So that's why this one is a J type. And like there's very distinct characteristics on the sword that are, you know, indicative of the mold that it came out of. So mine and this one from the show came out of the same mold. And uh, it was hilarious. They took it to um, a university, St. Mary's, a professor, Krista, I can't remember her name. We're on a first name basis now. She tested my sword too. And uh, they, she tested the, sh the sword from the show. And it's like, no, there's nothing uh, ancient here at all. This is a modern alloy. Uh, people were talking shit on the internet about my sword. And I was calling them on. I'm like, would you like, like, give me your number. I'll call you. I'll answer any questions you have. No, no. They just wanted to troll and talk, talk shit. It was hilarious. Somebody was saying mine was made out of wood and plastic. And anyway, I don't know where you got. Anyway, but just blatant lies because they were in defense of Hutton, right? Uh, the show sword was real, but mine was fake. Anyway, this has been known as the Italian eBay sword because it was bought on Italian eBay from Italy from some. Okay, shop. I, a, I do have a question. Yep. How much did you pay for that sword from 1970s? I don't recall, Kelly. Um, <laughs> it was something like 90 euros, maybe. Okay. It didn't matter. <laughs> looks kind of <laughs> kinda neat for a for a, a 90 euro like weird looking sword. Yeah. Like. <laughs> Yeah, Kelly, it was, it was, I was just on eBay. To, yeah, it was to, to be part of the story and and help make fun of Hutton, right? Okay. So you're not, he's not petty. Trevor's not petty. No, oh. but I hate that guy. Like, I wonder how many. Douche. I wonder how many hundreds and thousands of these have been sold. Uh, I don't know if there's hundreds of thousands, but they pop up every once in a while. So there's a whole poster of these things. And the, the, the types that they're grouped in is all called Swordgate. Anyway, Andy was writing a blog about it. And Hutton threatened to sue him again very recently, Jordan. Like very recently, Andy put a video out, uh, started a GoFundMe or whatever to raise money for his lawyer. And wow. uh, I shared it and donated stuff. So anyway, that was probably one of the most ridiculous th claims that this was a real Roman artifact and it was going to change history. It made all the yeah. mainstream media. It did some real mainstream. damage to the Oak Island story because a lot of people were like, it, what ended up in the mainstream media made it sound like there was a major discovery very quickly. It was like kind of BS. So mm -hmm. I got caught up in the, in the whole telling of it was that it made it look like the people behind the Oak Island treasure hunt were putting forth these fake kind of ideas. But it's there's just so much more to it than that. Yeah, yeah, ridiculous. All right. Um, so theories. Why don't we jump into theories? Yeah, who's so done you, it and what is it? Well, I guess we'll start with the kind of the skeptical theory that there isn't like there's a lot of people think there's just nothing to it. I talked about the bedrock being the type of rock that would easily dissolve. So some one of the kind of theories is that all the cavities under the island. 100% natural. Yep. Which, and as the bedrock dissolves and these cavities form, naturally there's going to be sinkholes. You put a bunch of sinkholes, you know, leave them there for a couple hundred years and then go digging stuff up, you're going to find stuff in there. Like where I grew up, we had a sinkhole in the woods, kind of like behind my house. And I remember my, we had a, my dad bought a new oven. And I remember my brother and I and my dad in a wheelbarrow. <laughs> to the sinkhole and threw it in <laughs> what people did but i'm uh, sure you know well you push over years a suddenly, house you'd push over houses and, and put dirt on them definitely yeah yeah no, and nova and scotia garbage. is littered with sinkholes yeah, especially this part of nova scotia where oak island is that Mahone bay area that type of rock is just naturally causes a lot of it so you put a bunch of sinkholes in an area with a history of fishing and boat building you're going to find some weird stuff deep underground so mm -hmm. First theory is that that's all it is and that there is no story. But that one's boring. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then there's um, a theory that it was pirates. Mm -hmm. um, and that a lot of that comes from the fact that when you talk about, you know, the period of time in the, you know, the earth, early 1900s, late 1800s, when some of the early days of the treasure hunting was happening, that was an area with like Captain Kidd and all this stuff was like 
big in fiction and storytelling. So naturally, that kind of found its way. Yeah, because this. there's there's a um, Captain Kid book that has a treasure map in it, and the island is shaped like Oak Island. So that that's the Captain Kid connection there. Um, some people think it's the Spanish. Mm-hmm. Um, now there's the whole Knights Templar connection with the um, Shakespeare. It's, it's like the, the mystery has found its way to reinvent itself, but with the flavor of the era. So back in the day when, you know, um, pirates are a big thing, that was all the theories were involving pirates and booty and treasure and treasure maps and all this. Now it's a lot of it is a, a, around you know, the, the Spanish, the Knights Templar finding a way to, you know, move like the treasures of the um, Catholic church, trying to hide them. And maybe they hid them in a small um, under a small Island in Nova Scotia. And a part of that comes from the fact that if you believe that the money pit was man-made and these drains were man-made, thus the, almost the entire Island was man-made. It, it couldn't have been some pirates. It would have had to be some right. major group, something like military or something funded by the Catholic church. Um, and that's kind of where a lot of these theories come from. Um, one of the things that I've always wondered, Jordan, is if this was um, as large of a engineering undertaking as it would have been to construct a hole this deep, um, it would have taken an army, so either a legitimate army or an army of slaves. Mm. And they need to be fed. They need to be housed. There should be somewhere on the island evidence of an encampment. They have found military evidence of military presence on the island. So that's um, an English. English for sure. Do you know if they found any other They've, there's been so many uh, connections to the French, English, Spanish, Portuguese, um, but nothing significant. Like it's, it, they're, they're vague connections. It'll be like pieces of uniform, musket, um, musket ball, lead for musket balls. Yeah. But when you're talking about like an army of slaves finding, you know, let's say you, you go to where the pyramids are built, you find these massive areas where they were living and stuff. Right. That's when there should be some kind of evidence of that. Now I know. And it's uh, a small Island. So Dunfield did a lot of damage, but still, you know, or you keep your slaves on your ship and you shuttle them back and forth every day. Mm -hmm. Then you risk being seen. That's, you know, when was this done? And, and what was the, um, life like on the mainland at the time mm-hmm. i don't know kelly mm-hmm. any questions are you going Thoughts? to invest kelly will you invest in trevor and i are going to start a company and dig no mm-hmm. you're not convinced no i'm gonna go and buy my swords off of ebay <laughs> <laughs> uh, wh- what's you kelly what do you think about honestly kelly like do you when honestly I, want to know what I think? Hold on. First, let me ask you a question. And then <laughs> you can. Okay, go. What do you think about those bones coming out of the money pit area from that depth below 140 feet from that time period and DNA to those areas? What are those? How do you explain those bones? Okay. So, some. Okay. So, uh, it's Nova Scotia, it's Halifax area, um, indigenous people were there that's part of it but we also know that cook cook landed on nova scotia in in 1497 too though right i don't know if that's like there there are explorers that are european that have basically come to nova scotia around that time so i'm thinking that it's possible that there could have been people there at that point in time. And I also think that with some of the Kelly, how do those bones get 140 feet below the surface on an island in Nova Scotia? Regardless well, how do they, of okay. So how did um, Nowland's um, cross get as well? I, like, Nowland's cross could very or, or, well sorry, be natural. 
could be natural or could be. But those bones aren't natural. How do you get bones 140 feet below the surface on an island in that time period? In that time period? Yeah, you're talking the 1500s. I know, but I'm just saying that there was European people there on the. Yeah, there were Euro- European people that, yes, there was. No one's denying that. Right. But what are they doing 140 feet underground? I have no idea. Is it cool? Poor asylum? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Maybe they're like digging a hole and like some bones that were on the surface just kind of fell in and they're like, whoops. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> one of those guys with the bulldozers is like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a plausible, you know, Adriel, that's a plausible explanation. If the if if that part of the island was a sinkhole and a couple of dudes were buried there, one from England and one from uh, the Middle East, and uh, their graves collapsed and they just sunk down. Okay. What what about the, were they buried with all the uh, all the parchment, all the book all the books and stuff? Like we're pulling up book binding material too. Correct. But know. we know that if we know that if people were there, especially European people were there, there's other things that are going to be there. Do they have a habit well. of burying books? No, but we also know that when we do archaeological digs, that you're going to find pottery, you're going to find uh, books, you're going to find you are going to find things that are from books. those that all sorts of weird stuff. All kinds of weird things from that time period. Not at that depth. So your theory again, is that it migrated down. So right. Like I don't know. Again, well, what is your theory? That just magically appears? Don't have one. I just okay. know that it's there's no logical explanation for those things to be under the ground at that depth other than someone put them there Okay. by unnatural means, by digging, by excavation. Or salting it. Or and salting. remember, um, yeah, I don't think that... Now, Adriel, the story of the three gold chains and the and the ninety foot stone and everything about ten X, I I agree is salting. Um, the stone triangle, Nolan's cross, the weird shit they're pulling out of the swamp. We never even, we didn't even cover the swamp tonight. Yeah, but I can I can never um, as obsessed as I've been with this mystery for most of my life. Um, I can't tell you my theory. Like I can't. the the most The one that intrigues me the most is Peter Omnison's theory, which is um, that it's, it's a very long, complicated, but basically Shakespeare's folio is a treasure map, and the treasure map leads to Oak Island and the um, menorah from King Solomon's tomb is buried in the swamp on Oak Island. That sum it up, Jordan, pretty quick. Uh, yeah, and you pretty much like to to fill in the blanks of how that all makes sense. Is like it's that would be its own episode of this show. Yeah, okay. yeah, for sure. Yeah. It, the thing with Oak Island is it's like there, it's, it's all so vague and unclear that it's really easy to kind of take the mystery, yep. kind of plug it into any like theory you want to build, and you can kind of create an argument for it. And, so I think like what's so cool is these people who are, have these fascinating ideas that are way out there. They manage to kind of make it sound half reasonable. Plausible, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Then some of them just no. <laughs> some of them are nuts, yeah. But, but I think that I quite honestly I think that it's fantastic. Like it's really fascinating, and people want it's like treasure hunters. It's basically, people want to believe in this and and make plausible. Right, because it's like we were kids, and when we were kids, we're going on a treasure hunt. We want to be able to find something. We want to be able to explain it. We want to, and if something does actually get found, it's kind of like, ooh, like I'm it's rich. I, I'm rich, and there's going to be people that are going to continue to invest in that. And just like Trevor, you said, right, with uh, like a, a gold mine, right? People went out west because they thought that there was a gold mine. People are investing. People are digging uh, on Oak Island because they want to find something they want to believe in that folklore that there's something there yeah i mean there's still some other stuff to to discover out there right. so some of these things are still going to be true and some of them are going to be worth going after and then right. so at, we'll get to a point where there's very few things to discover <laughs> it takes a lot of work and you go to go for a lot of wild goose chases after this kind of stuff yeah gary drayden's been all over that island with a metal detector and he's found a lot of cool stuff um, no treasure, but a lot of cool stuff and to, to speak to the history of the island, yep. um, both, you know, just regular inhabitants and um, 
treasure hunting um, stuff, you know, evidence of, of seekers. Um, Samuel Ball. We can't talk about Oak Island without talking about Samuel Ball. Samuel Ball was a uh, man who was granted his freedom from slavery for fighting for the British during the American War of uh, Independence. When the war was over, he um, fled to Canada and mm -hmm. became a cabbage farmer on Oak Island. He went from being a cabbage farmer on Oak Island, freed slave cabbage farmer on Oak Island, to one of the wealthiest men in Nova Scotia. One doesn't, and, um, one doesn't become one of the wealthiest men in Nova Scotia by growing cabbage on Oak Island. So there's a lot of theories that he discovered part of the treasure or maybe the treasure okay because overnight he was rich it's historical it's documented his uh, lot is a um, protected site they need permits to do anything there they actually mm -hmm. found a tag like off of a piece of luggage or whatever with his initials on it on his lot that was pretty cool but um yeah th there's doug crawl um is like the resident Oak Island historian. He started off as a fan, got to know the brothers. Now he's part of the team. Uh, a guy who I just knew on the internet, Scott Barrow. Uh, he's from Prince Edward Island. He almost hooked me up with a job on Oak Island. It was like it's, that close. He's on the sh on the island working and a part of the show now. So yeah. I wanted him to come on, but he he would even he would just to come on and talk. He would have to get the permission because of the non disclosure agreements and stuff. Right. He suggested I reach out to Doug, but I know Doug's pretty busy. So Jordan, it was the you were the. I'm third. happy to be your third. Yeah, thanks, man. <laughs> you should have been my first. It just made more sense to have you on, actually. But, yeah, oh, it was really interesting listening to you guys talk yeah. about it. it. Sounds like you're both super passionate about it, and uh, sounds like. We'll only really scratch the surface of this too. Yeah. yeah I was supposed to go back for another private tour this year, but the person organizing it pulled the plug already. It's like, it pulled wasn't the plug. Till, yeah, it's uh, not till are you August. Not talking about what happened last year. Oh, this year. I think yeah. this year. Last year. It uh, turned out last year that there was uh, a fraud involving uh, a person who was in charge of uh, organ tours. And yeah, that was bad. Hmm. Very bad. Yeah, it didn't affect uh, my group of friends though, but. I think it worked out for me because um, what ended up happening one time was I just sent an email being like, I had a friend coming into the town into the city and I wanted to go. So I wrote an email saying like, I'd like to get a, get on the Island. If there's any last minute tickets or anything, um, let me know. And he sent me an email back saying, if you send me some money transfer to my personal email, uh, I can get you the tickets. So I sent him the money and he sent me the tickets. So, oh, Wow. Uh, normally, that sounds greasy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, at the time, it seemed per perfectly normal. I was like, wow, these guys are awesome. But then when I heard he was arrested and charged with fraud and all this other stuff, I was like, ooh. Hmm. I wonder yeah. where that money went. Yeah, exactly. Huh. Well, you got on the island? Yeah. There you go. That's good. All's well that ends well. <laughs> and speaking of ending, we should wrap this up. I'd like to thank you once again for coming on Slam Fire. Um, go ahead and uh, tell all of our listeners who uh, may not be aware where they can find the Nighttime Podcast. Um, yeah, it's, it's basically wherever you find Slamfire Radio, I guess, and any podcast platform, search for Nighttime. I cover Canadian crimes, mysteries, and weird and unique stories. So uh, search for Nighttime on the internet. Awesome. And uh, I, I tell you, it's, it's an incredibly well-produced show. It's polished it's well researched it's entertaining it's informative i look forward to every episode um awesome. and like i said if ever you need another another raspy voice let me know you'll be back again you've been on two episodes i think you've been on so you were on the a bonus episode no you were you were the bonus episode about emma philipoff then you were on the episode for the Lindsay Sivanroth series where you were discussing the firearms used. And right. And then my voice was yeah. on the... Um, Bernie Langell part Bern two. You yeah. played a cop or something. Uh, yeah. Military investigator or something. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know there's a CBC documentary coming out about that? Wow. Yeah. They've been uh, for the last like 
eight months or so they've been working with Bernie and uh, that's crazy. Yeah. It's going to be a full length documentary. Oh, nice. Yeah. Pretty that's good. awesome. Hmm. Cool. All right. Well, let's wrap it up guys. Um, Thanks for having me, everybody. Thank you, man. The pleasure is all ours and uh, I'm sure we'll find a reason to do it again sometime. Anytime. And everybody else will see you on Thursday.